every perfumer shall have his own shop and not invade another's. Members of the guild are to keep watch on, on one another to prevent the sale of adulterated products. They are not to stock poor quality goods in the shops. A sweet smell and a bad smell do not go together. They are to sell pepper, spikenard, cinnamon, aloes wood, ambergis, musk, frankincense, myrrh, balsam, indigo, dyer's herbs, lapis lazuli, fustic, storax, and in short, any article used for perfumery and dyeing. The stalls shall be placed in a row between the milestone and the revered icon of Christ that stands above the bronze arcade, so that the aroma may waft upwards to the icon and at the same time fill the vestibule of the royal palace. When the cargoes come from Haldia, Trebizond or elsewhere, they shall buy from the importers on the days appointed by the regulations. Importers shall not live in the city for more than three months. They shall sell their goods expeditiously and then return home. No member of the guild may purchase grocery goods or those sold by Steelyard. Perfumiers shall only buy goods that are sold by weight on scales. Any perfumier who currently trades also as a grocer shall be allowed to choose one or the other of these trades and shall be forbidden henceforth to carry on the trade that he does not choose. This from uh, the late 800s and from the Emperor Leo VI, which is known later as the Wise, comes from a book of regulations in the Constantinople's Guilds of Retail Traders. The trade in aromatics figures prominently in the book of the Eparch, and these tradesmen dealt not only with perfumes and dyes, but also in the spices that they were used in food, drink, medicine and incense. Hello, 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 hello! Welcome back to another episode of The Delicious Legacy with me, Thomas Dinas. This is part two of the exploration of the European medieval cuisine. And today we're continuing our adventure to medieval Europe through its cuisine and recipes and cookbooks of late medieval time. On the last episode, we've seen... um, a few details on um, pies and some certain foods from uh, medieval Europe which were very popular and we touched some basic cookbooks and cuisines from around Europe, France and England mainly. So let's explore and delve into additional medieval European recipes. Countless European recipes for dough or butter, fried in hot grease in a pan or pot, such as crepes, fritters or donuts, existed. They could be simple pancakes with garnish of elaborate fillings of meat, vegetables, nuts or fruits surrounded with dough. These dishes were especially popular in Germany, where they were known as Krapfen. To prepare fritters for Lent, the Book of Good Food recommends mixing ground nuts and diced apples with spices, filling the fritters with this stuffing and frying them in a pan. Two food preparations must be named that the rich and famous of medieval Europe loved to indulge in at the end of a meal. Marzipan and Hippocras. Presumably of Arabic origin, the sweet meat marzipan was by 1340 known in Italy and southern France, where the word referred to both the almond paste and the box in which it was kept. Its principal ingredients of sugar, almonds and rose water, marzipan has in common with many other Arab-Persian desserts. No medieval banquet was complete, however, without a round of Hippocrates, the famous spiced wine named after the Greek physician Hippocrates and of course drawing an influence from ancient uh, Greco Roman Conditon Paradoxum. The recipe for Hippocras from the Menagier de Paris is one of the shorter ones we have surviving. It asks for one ounce of long tube cinnamon, a knob of ginger, and an equal amount of galingale to be pounded together 
with a pound of sugar. The spice powder is then left to steep in a gallon of the best wine for one hour and subsequently strained several times through a cloth bag to clarify the wine. A version of this I made um, last year for, uh, for a medieval banquet uh, I did uh, in South London. If there is one type of dish that is characteristic of late medieval French cuisine, it is the potage or broth. The viandiers two extensive sections on thick potages and thick meatless potages underline their importance and great variety. What is meant by meatless potages is not vegetable dishes, however, but potages made from fish, dishes that were suitable for fast days, such as uh, before the Easter Sundays or the Lent for Easter, and uh, potages and boets or broths were a favorite first course. Uh, judging from the French menus of the time. These dishes would have followed the starter, often in the form of seasonal fruit, whose function it was to open the mouth of the stomach, as such, and prepare it for the main dishes that were thought to take longer to cook. By that, the medieval manuals mean the dishes that they were taking longer to digest. In the viandiers, uh, we have the white capon broth, which is a typical example of uh, this genre of dish. To prepare this blanc brue of uh, sapons, de sapons, the capons are cooked in wine and water, then broken into pieces and fried in bacon grease. The dark capon meat, the chicken livers and almonds are ground up, steeped in the broth and boiled with the other meat. Then a mixture of ground ginger, cinnamon, cloves, galingal, long pepper and grains of paradise is added, followed by well-beaten and strained egg yolks. Here it's worth mentioning um, what galangal is, because um, I don't think it's so well known nowadays in Europe, but in medieval time it was one of the most popular spices used uh, widely across uh, the recipes in medieval Europe. So galangal is a nobby, shallow root that grows from the rhizomes of the ginger family. And um, yeah, it bears relation to ginger both in smell and appearance and uh, taste. But it's not ginger per se, it's a different plant. And it appears to have traveled from China to Arabia and then was introduced into Europe, probably as early as the 10th century. And it's been used a lot in recipes and we have, it was one of the ingredients in Hippocras, the spiced wine, the very popular medieval spiced wine, as we mentioned before. And in 1179, uh, St. Hildegard of Bingen, the famed uh, German herbalist and mystic, refers to it as uh, the spice of life in her seminal work, Physica. She provides a snuff-like treatment for the relief of colds and sinus inflammation and considering its powerful scent, a spicy mixture of ginger and mustard with a hot, bitterly medicinal taste, it's fairly obvious that it would apply quite a shock to the olfactory system. So yeah, galangal and um, ginger and uh, grains of paradise and turmeric all more or less belong to the same family of uh, plants and you know, you can feel the spiciness and the citrusy zinkiness that they have in their hotness yeah they're all used they all used in this, in cooking and as medicine when these uh, potages contained the spice cumin they were called cominet for fish cominet that opens the section on the thick meatless potages the fish is cooked in water or fried in oil and then boiled in almond milk to which ground ginger cumin, infused in wine, and vesuvius are added. The recipe concludes with the remark that the sugar is required if this comine is served as a dish for the ailing. In a bourgeois household, such as that of Menagier, the broth might have followed by a poré, a soup of leafy greens. Poré blanche was prepared from leeks and onions that were fried and cooked in cow's milk or almond milk, depending on whether it was a midday or a fast day. The menagier have continued his meal with a civet of hair. To prepare it, the hair first was roasted on a spit, then cut into pieces, fried in grease with chopped onions, and subsequently boiled in a dark broth made of toasted bread infused in wine and beef broth or pea puree. Ground ginger, cinnamon, cloves, grains of paradise and saffron are the spices that event lists in his uh, civet recipes. 
judging from the variety of uh, different spices that uh, are listed, it seems uh, that um, by this time, with the um, crusades and the trade between the Arab world and Europe, uh, spices were very, very popular in an ever-expanding proportion of uh, the population. So not only the very high classes, but also some uh, middle classes and bigger households had um, access to one f- spice or another, like black pepper, grains of paradise, ground ginger and cinnamon. Still, sugar was highly expensive and was considered a, a spice and was used sparingly and only by the very, very rich households. Going to Spain, one of the Hispano-Arabic cookbooks, given the name the Almohade cookbook by a modern scholar, is a good example of the fusion between Arab and Hispanic European elements, especially in upper-class cuisine. The first two chapters of the cookbook deal with simple meat dishes, in particular stews, pounded meat preparations and roasts. The next four chapters are of thickened dishes, vegetables, fish and starchy dishes made of couscous, rice, pasta and the like. The last chapter gives recipes for pastries and sweets. The cuisine is based on olive oil as a cooking fat compared to lard or um, butter from Northern Europe and uses wheat and wheat flour for a variety of leavened and unleavened doughs that were often baked or deep fried. Lamb and mutton were the preferred types of meat also mentioned are goat and rabbit. Chickens and partridges are frequently listed fowl, and eggplant, or aubergine, introduced to Europe by the Arabs, is the favorite vegetable. The dishes were seasoned with a number of herbs and spices, in particular coriander seeds and leaves, mint, thyme, fennel, cumin, caraway, citron leaves, saffron, pepper, cinnamon, spikenard, which is an East Indian herb of the Valerian family, ginger, clove, nutmeg, galingale, sugar, and so on. Instead of garum, the salty fish uh, sauce we have seen in the past that the Greeks and Romans used, the Arabs of the Iberian Peninsula used the sauce muri, a highly concentrated salt solution made from uh, fermented bread that was uh, similar in a way, let's say, similar to soy sauce. In order to thicken sauces, the Arabs in Spain developed their own techniques and a special terminology, either eggs or starts in the form of bread crumbs or pounded almonds were used. Many Moorish dishes were given an au gratin finish, not found in other parts of the medieval Arab world. Sealed dishes, so to speak, with uh, the lid sealed to the pot and left to cook on the drying ashes for a long time, were also popular. This technique was also applied by the Spanish Jews for preparing the adafina and other elaborate dishes of the Sabbath, as we will see later on. Pounded meat turned into spicy little meatballs and deep-fried dough preparations were the two more features of the Hispano-Arab cuisine, where the fusion between Baghdad and the old Hispanic and Roman traditions is most obvious though is in the use of olive oil, rather than the tail fat of sheep that was customary in the Middle East and in the European way of making cheese. The fact that many dishes in the Almohade cookbook, which contains something like 220 recipes, have no counterpart in the Middle Eastern cookery of the time, speaks for the unique character of the Muslim Spain's cuisine. I'll be back after this short break. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. My name's Dr Neil Buttery and I'm host of the British Food History Podcast, a podcast that you, as a fan of The Delicious Legacy, might be interested in. I explore British food and its history in all its glory, with interviews with special guests, recipes, reenactments, and tracking down forgotten recipes and hyper-regional specialities. Previous topics include medieval eels, 18th century dining, curry, London street food sellers, breakfast, and the good old Yorkshire pudding. Search for the British Food History Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the delicious legacy. Cheers! Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever your needs, Malbin Greek has you covered. 
you can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London, Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. The Almohad Caliphate was a North African Berber Muslim empire founded in the 12th century and at its height controlled much of the Iberian Peninsula, so what was called Al-Andalus, and of course North Africa, what was called the Maghreb. So the book, this anonymous Andalusian cookbook, it was the book of cooking in Maghreb and Andalus in that era. And yeah, it contains many recipes, roughly 220, and also information about healthy cooking, what foods should be taken alone and what should not be mixed with other foods, customs of many peoples and their countries, uh, hygiene, utensils, basic ingredients, and wealth of information from that era and um, of um, Arab Spain. The Almohad cookbook contains five dishes that are labeled Jewish. One is a dafina or buried dish, an elaborate stew usually containing lamb, onion and chickpeas. The other a cold dish made with eggs, cheese and eggplant. They also include a Jewish partridge with almond, pine nut, coriander and egg stuffing that is also inserted under the skin of the bird. The sauce in which it's stewed is made with cinnamon, mint and citron leaves, vinegar, sugar and muri, the salty fermented sauce we mentioned earlier. Pistachios, almonds, pine nuts and hard-boiled egg yolks are also used to garnish the dish. To prepare a Jewish dish of chicken, as it's called, the bird is roasted and then marinated in muri, vinegar, rose water, onion juice and other aromatic ingredients. It is served in a sauce made from the giblets of the bird, onion juice again, coriander, pine nuts, vinegar, oil, citron leaves and fennel stalks, thickened with eggs, flour, breadcrumbs and crushed chicken liver. A simpler dish eaten on the Sabbath was the harissa, a type of porridge contained meat that could be bought ready-made from street vendors. A recipe for adafina, as we said, it is included in the cookbook, and it goes like this. Adafina, stuffed buried Jewish dish. Meatballs flavored with cumin and other spices. Rose water and onion juice are cooked in a pot between two layers of cinnamon-flavored omelette and covered by a third omelette of egg combined with pounded meat, salt, pepper, cinnamon and rose water. The dish is served garnished with pistachios, pine nuts, mint leaves and a sprinkling of spices. This was complex and time-consuming to prepare, and even more than the Arabs, the Sephardim Jews were fond of meat and fruit combinations, and of the sweet and sour dishes whose characteristic taste was achieved by mixing sour pomegranate juice, tamarind, sour grapes, lemon, or vinegar with sugar or honey. In this Andalusian cookbook, there were also the hallmarks of Persian cuisine with which both the Arabs and the Jews had historical ties. And overall, the Sephardic cookery had been described as essential, aromatic, and colorful, and as making use of anything that gives flavor, seeds, bits of bark, resins, pods, petals, pistils, and flower waters. With the forced conversion of Jews in the end of the Middle Ages came a fusion of culinary practices in Spain. Like Spanish Christians, conversos began to mix meat and milk, add pork and selfies to their traditional dishes and use pork fat instead of olive oil as a cooking fat. This is what happened to the adafina, which in time became just one of the many types of stew of the cocido and olla type eaten all across Spain. Best known today is perhaps the olla podrida, a stew made with meat, chicken, chickpeas, large pork sausage, cabbage, garlic, saffron and cumin. Sephardic Jews were the Jews, the Jewish populations and the Jewish diaspora of Spain and of the Iberian Peninsula in general. These Jewish communities prospered for centuries under the Muslim reign of Al-Andalus. Now the precise origins of these Jewish communities of the Iberian Peninsula is unclear. Perhaps a substantial Jewish immigration occurred during the Roman period of uh, Hispania. The Iberian Peninsula was under Roman control and if we are to believe uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, 
then as early as 90 uh, CE, there were already a Jewish diaspora living in Europe. So, yes, in Spain too. Perhaps the most direct and substantial of early references are the several decrees of the Council of Elvira, convened in the early 4th century, which addresses proper Christian behavior with regard to the Jews of Hispania. The decline of Jewish uh, communities across Iberia and uh, the decline of and of its golden age began during the completion of the Christian Reconquista, which basically was um, the period of uh, the Spanish reconquest of uh, Spain from uh, the Arabs. As various Arab lands fell to the Christians, conditions for the Jews in the emerging Christian kingdoms became increasingly uh, difficult. The severe persecution of uh, the Jewish minority groups began um, to take a more um, cruel effect under the rulers Ferdinand and Isabella. The Catholic monarchs fought for the expulsion or mass conversions or murder of those uh, of Muslim or uh, Jewish faiths. In the Catalan um, uh, book Libre de Saint Sauvé, uh, which is a cookbook again, we have a recipe for poultry pie, panades de pols, abaldem, poultry pie with egg and verjuice sauce. Take parboiled hens and put them in pastry with slices of salted pork and make the sauce. Take eggs, beat them and add as much verjuice as necessary. When the pie is cooked, put the sauce in the pie and return it to the oven briefly so the sauce thickens. And if you don't have verjuice for the sauce, use vinegar. Another important Catalan cookbook that became much more influential than the Libre de Saint Sauvé, thanks to the invention of printing, is the Libre de Koch. It was put together in the 15th century by certain Mestre Robert, or Rupert de Nola, who called himself cook to Don Ferrando, Rey de Naples, the King of Naples. Through him, through Mestre Robert, Catalan cooking became more widely known in Italy. But the influence went both ways, with the Catalan cook also incorporating Italian recipes and cooking styles in his repertoire. The cookbook was published in Catalan in 1520 and in Castilian translation 1525. It quickly became a bestseller and by the late 18th century had gone through several editions in both languages. And as a truly Mediterranean cookbook, contained recipes and combined recipes of Catalan, Italian, French and Arab origin. The frequent use of orange and other fruit juice, and of nuts, especially hazelnuts, pine nuts, almonds and almond milk, also point to Catalonia's rich Arab culinary heritage. Going northwards uh, into the German-speaking countries, the food of German-speaking Europe was quite different from that of the Mediterranean world in the Middle Ages. This was part due to the fact that the climate was harsher, obviously, which made it impossible to cultivate olives and almonds and citrus fruits. And with most of Central Europe being far removed from any ocean, the main fish uh, to be had were freshwater fish. However, if sea fish was available, were usually the lower grade herring and cod that were salted or dried before being transported inland, of course. Germanic tribes, which really were at the edge of uh, the frontier of the Roman Empire, never really adopted uh, the Roman cuisine and gastronomy in a way that uh, the Spain and Italy did. So also Germany never came into direct uh, contact with the sophisticated Arab civilization, except perhaps for the old knight that went to a crusade or a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So all these elements brings us to the High Middle Ages, which um, bread and gruel was uh, the staples in Germany, especially for the poorer segments of the, of the population. The meat of the time was no longer the game meat from early medieval period, but uh, the meat of domesticated animals, primarily pork and beef. Other meat sources were sheep and goats, Rabbits, hares, ducks, geese, chickens, and the hunted animals uh, of mallards, barnacle geese, stag, and wild boar. The latter, however, were only a small fraction of the overall meat consumption. 
The fish eaten in northern German town of Lübeck included carp, bream, pike, sturgeon, cod, and plaice. The types of grains cultivated in 13th century Germany were barley, oats, rye, wheat, spelt, buckwheat, and millet. Barley and oats were the most popular, and millet was the grain eaten by the poor and in times of famine. For wedding banquets in early 14th century Berlin, the limit was five courses and 40 platters for the bourgeoisie. At that time, only the aristocracy was allowed eight courses. But by 1500s, this rule was no longer observed. The banquet given by the town clerk in Frankfurt, for instance, consisted of eight courses whose sequence was modeled after the aristocratic banquets encountered earlier in England, France, and Mediterranean regions. An appetizer of strawberries with sugar was followed by six meat courses. Chicken, mutton stew, boiled mutton, roast chicken, roast mutton, and half a goose in sauce. Cheese and cherries concluded the feast. It is true that some of the ingredients, such as sugar, raisins, and kebabs, which is the dried unripe berries of uh, the East Indian shrub of the pepper family, and nutmeg were expensive imports. But real high-end foodstuffs, such as game and saffron, are not mentioned. In this selection of dishes and the expenses incurred, the banquet was probably comparable to the festive meals in the Ménagère de Paris. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. This podcast can keep going only with your generous support. So please, if you feel uh, like um, you're enjoying the episodes and you want me to do more of them faster and in more detail, please uh, support me on Patreon. Uh, If you search the Delicious Legacy Podcast and Patreon, you'll find my page. And there you can uh, give from $3 a month and uh, keep me going. And on top, get access to exclusive material and extra bits from the podcast. And uh, I would like to thank all of my Patreon backers so far. And of course, uh, all of you listeners out there on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, that you keep listening um, the episodes. Please get in touch if you have any ideas for um, other episodes or if you have any questions on what you've heard on this one. And please, yeah, uh, hit me up with your own um, ideas and uh, recipes from uh, medieval world and beyond. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next week with part three of uh, the history of medieval European cuisine, where we go to England finally and to Byzantium. And we explore the links between the two far-flung corners of Europe. See you soon. Take care.